All right, uh, we're going to start uh, talking about thermodynamics uh, with this video, and uh, this will be a topic that keeps us busy uh, for a couple of weeks, give or take. Uh, in your textbook, uh, thermodynamics is the topic of chapters nine and 10. Okay, so we're venturing into chapter nine as we start off uh, here. I'm going to talk about energy and uh, energy and chemical reactions. Okay. Uh, in normal chemical reactions, it is uh, reasonable to say that energy is conserved. Right. Uh, we have uh, mentioned that point here and there, but we haven't really uh, taken it up in any meaningful way. Uh, but now it's time to do that. Uh, it is definitely the case that energy can be converted from one form to another. Right. When uh, you when you burn a fuel, you're burning gas uh, in the engine of your car, uh, you very definitely are uh, producing uh, liberating energy, which you use to move the car forward. Right. Uh, that energy is uh, being converted from what we might call chemical energy uh, into uh, the energy that is uh, being the engine is then converting to the motion of the car. Right. Uh, and so uh, this chemical energy, we can think of that as energy that is stored uh, in the bonds in a molecule is probably the best way to put this. Uh, that can be released as heat uh, or as light in some cases uh, in other forms of energy batteries uh, convert chemical energy into electrical energy. Right. Uh, and uh, those obviously have a, a very important role uh, in our existence these days, uh, more so than ever, because we rely on more things uh, that are powered by batteries than uh, probably ever before. So uh, this chemical energy that uh, I'm talking about now, how, how can we describe that? Uh, it's uh, associated with the bonds in the molecules and it's really a form of potential energy, okay? Uh, it comes about, just like a lot of things having to do with bonds in molecules, it comes about because of charges on particles, right? Uh, so a molecule really is a collection of charged particles. I have uh, you know, my uh, protons uh, and electrons in the atoms. I have uh, the various uh, charge uh, distributions uh, across the atoms in the molecule and all those things uh, are, are uh, setting up this collection of charges, right? Uh, and there's going to be potential energy associated with that. Anytime I take two charged particles and I have them some known distance apart, there's a potential energy that we could calculate from that. Uh, basic rule for doing thermodynamics in chemistry, which is uh, important and which can often help you figure out uh, what uh, should be the sign on the outcome of a calculation. It turns out in thermodynamics, the sign can sometimes be a, a confusing issue. But uh, any time that we're making bonds, that should release energy, right? When we started talking about bonding, when we took up chapter seven, I said that a bond will form between two atoms if and only if doing the forming the bond will lower the total energy of the two atoms, right? That's still true. And so whenever I make a bond, that should be releasing energy because the atoms themselves have less energy stuck together. That means the excess energy that they no longer have has to have gone somewhere. Right. Breaking bonds, on the other hand, is always going to cost energy. Uh, we can picture that as saying the bond doesn't just like fall apart on its own, right? If you could picture having uh, some sort of uh, actually two balls held together by a spring or a stick, uh, if you wanted to break them apart, you'd have to actually pull on them to be able to break that, uh, that spring or the stick that was holding them together, right? That's what happens when we break a bond. Uh, this is similar in a way to when we talked about the uh, photoelectric effect. We said that, uh, you know, the uh, atom didn't want to spit out the electron, so the uh, photon had to use use some energy to do work to break the electron free. In this case, we're talking about breaking the atoms apart in a molecule, okay? Uh, so keep those ideas in mind if you're ever like really hung up on uh, things. Uh, often those ideas, not always, but a lot of times those ideas can help us sort of uh, anticipate what the sign should be on a particular uh, quantity. So in thermodynamics, uh, you will see over these uh, two chapters uh, that uh, we work with a lot of quantities uh, that uh, are, are delta something. Okay, the first one of these we're going to talk about is, is delta E, uh, the change in energy, or probably more properly, the change in internal energy. Okay, uh, some, uh, some books, and uh, particularly physics books, tend to call this delta U uh, rather than delta E. So uh, if you've seen delta U someplace, this is, is the same thing. We're just going to use E for energy. Okay, uh, the delta quantity is always the change in whatever we're talking about, uh, and it should generally be true that we can define that by saying it's the value of that quantity at the end. Uh, so in the end of my chemical reaction, what do I have? I have the products, right? So uh, it's the energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants. Okay, that's a way to define delta E. And so that's the change in internal energy. Uh, this is really a conservation of energy thing, right? It says that uh, if there's a difference in the energy of the reactants and products, that energy had to go someplace and I should be able to find it uh, in simple terms. Uh, and this delta E should tell me how much energy that is. 
right? Uh, if I'm burning a fuel, then my energy is probably being liberated as, as thermal energy, as heat, right? Uh, but this, these sorts of relationships let me figure out how much heat should I perhaps be able to get by burning a particular amount of fuel. Right? So uh, you can kind of imagine that there's lots of, of useful uh, uh, applications of these ideas. So, oh gosh, delta y is not right. That means somehow a u turned into a y. I apologize for that profusely. Uh, must be a font switch or something like that. But uh, delta E is uh, this change in internal energy, right? Uh, it's the products minus the reactants. If delta E is positive, uh, that means the energy in the molecules has increased, right? So if delta E is going to be positive, uh, that means the energy of the products is bigger than the energy of the reactants. So that means that my, my molecules took in energy somewhere from someplace, right? Uh, and conversely, if delta E uh, turns out to be negative, that'll mean that uh, the process has released energy, right? So uh, it's important to get used to those, those signs. We always talk about delta E and we don't generally talk about E itself. Uh, the reason for that is because there's no universally agreed scale for, for like what's the zero point in energy. Right? Uh, if you have uh, ever done like potential energy problems in a physics class or, or engineering class or something like that, right? Uh, you know that uh, in any problem you get to pick one time, you get to pick where the potential energy is zero. And then once you've chosen where zero is, you figure everything else out relative to that. Right. Uh, so you might say zero potential energy is your object sitting on a tabletop, or you might say it's when it's sitting on the floor. Uh, but once you've made that choice, you can't just change it again. Right. Uh, the same is true here. That's why we talk about delta E, because there's not a universal agreement of, of what would be the, uh, the absolute scale for energy. I'm going to talk about a couple of examples here, uh, which uh, this is one of those cases where if we were in a real classroom, uh, I usually actually do these reactions uh, because they're not hard to do. Uh, but uh, here I have one that says uh, I don't have any calcium chloride sitting around in my home that I can dissolve uh, and measure the temperature of it while that happens, alas. Uh, but uh, you'll have to take my word for it, I guess. Uh, if I take calcium chloride, which is an ionic solid, uh, if I dissolve it in water, uh, the reaction, a uh, simple one, dissociation uh, on the screen there should happen, right? Uh, hopefully you all uh, would, would write that equation uh, if, if asked to do so. Uh, when this happens, it turns out, uh, if I put a thermometer in the, uh, the water while I d dissolve the calcium chloride, the solution gets hot. Okay, uh, that's just an observable fact. It, it spontaneously gets hot uh, as the stuff is dissolving. I don't have to do anything. I'm not supplying, I'm not putting it on a hot plate or anything like that. I just take my, my room temperature water. I dissolve the solid in there. They're both starting off at the same temperature, but the solution gets hot. Why does it get hot? It gets hot because heat is being released in this process. Okay, uh, this is a strange one uh, because this one doesn't seem like we've made any bonds, right? I told you that uh, if we form bonds, uh, that should release energy, right? This one looks like I broke bonds, right? Because I took the calcium chloride where they were stuck together and I tore them apart into separate ions, okay? Uh, but the observation is that heat is released. Uh, the delta E for this process, therefore, is negative. Uh, there's a fancier word for that. We say that the reaction is exothermic, meaning it, it liberates thermal energy. Uh, exothermic is a fancy word for it gets hot. Okay. Uh, so how can this be? How can bonds be being formed here? Uh, this is actually a sort of subtle and tricky one. It has to do with the, the, the aqueous tags on here. right? Uh, and so it's true that the individual ions, the calcium and chloride ions are very definitely being taken apart and that costs energy. It takes energy to do that. There's no doubt about it, right? Uh, but what's happening in this case is my ions then are in the uh, solution with all the water molecules uh, and water molecules are coming up and approaching those ions. So what I'm getting is I'm getting a bunch of uh, ion dipole forces between the water molecules and the uh, oppositely charged ions, right? So uh, here is the green one is a chloride ion uh, and uh, it's got a negative charge on it, right? So if I have water molecules around, the water molecules are all going to spin themselves around so that a hydrogen end of the water molecule approaches the chloride. And I could probably fit you know, one or two more around there too. The calcium ion has a plus two charge. So when water molecules approach it, they're going to spin around so that the oxygen side approaches the calcium ion. And that means they're going to uh, have these, these uh, ion molecule interactions. Those are not real chemical bonds, but we can make a bunch of these. And together, those add up to enough energy to compensate for the fact that it costs energy to break the calcium chloride apart. That's not a case that I think you should be able to predict by looking at that reaction, okay? Uh, because I could do a different uh, dissociation reaction uh, like this one, 
right? Uh, this one says uh, potassium nitrate, KNO3, also is an ionic compound. It'll dissolve in water. Uh, if I dissolve this one, the solution actually gets cold. Okay. Again, same sort of experiment. I take the, the water and the solid. They're both sitting at room temperature. I mix them together, put a thermometer in there, uh, stir it up. And while I'm stirring it, I can see that the solution is getting colder. Okay. Uh, why is it getting colder? This one is counterintuitive for people. It's getting colder, ironically, because uh, the reaction is absorbing heat. Okay. Uh, how does that make the solution get colder? Where is it absorbing the heat from? What's around? The water. Right, uh, My reacting molecules, my potassium nitrate, while those ions are being torn apart, they're in the water. So if that reaction needs an input of heat, the place it can get it is from the water. As it pulls heat out of the water, that means it'll get colder. Right? Uh, again, this one is, is counterintuitive, but if you have a reaction and it reaction seems like it's getting cold while it's proceeding, that means it's actually absorbing heat. If you're touching the container the reaction is in, it'll feel cold to your hand because now it's pulling heat out of your hand, right? Uh, as opposed to the one where it's liberating heat, it's hot, you touch it, it feels hot. That's because heat's coming out from the reaction into your hand. Uh, this means uh, if heat is being absorbed by the reaction, that means the products, in this case, the ions over here have more energy than the KNO3 together. Uh, that means delta E was positive and we say the process was endothermic, meaning heat going in, okay? Uh, those two cases that I have here, for example, there's no way you can look at those reactions uh, and just know, uh, I can tell it's going to be positive or tell it's going to be negative, but there are cases when you can, right? Uh, suppose we're looking at a combustion reaction, right? Uh, suppose I wrote, uh, I don't know, I'll just write the combustion of methane here. Uh, we've done a lot of combustion reactions over the course of the semester. Right, uh, and if I do that, I guess I need uh, I need a two there and a two there, I think, and then I think I have a balanced equation uh, for burning my uh, my methane. Right, if I look at that reaction, uh, if I notice that it's a combustion reaction, I can say. I know what the sign of delta E for this reaction is going to be, right? This reaction is very definitely releasing heat. How do I know that? Uh, because if I could picture this reaction happening, it's on fire, right? Uh, this is uh, this is burning methane. That's what happens if you have a, a gas range uh, in your uh, home or apartment. You turn it on. That's the reaction that's taking place, and you know it's a source of heat, right? Uh, so for this thing, I could definitely say delta E for that needs to uh, be negative, right? Because negative means energy is coming out. That means the molecules, the atoms, when they're arranged as CO2 two and water have less energy content than they did when they were methane and oxygen. This is uh, the first of many times over the course of the rest of the semester that we will look at a diagram that looks kind of like this. Uh, what is it? It's the potential energy diagram for a chemical reaction. Okay, uh, so on the y axis I have labeled as energy. Think of that as the potential energy of the collection of atoms that are in our reaction. Okay. On the left-hand side, I have the reactants. On the right-hand side, I have the products. Uh, the in-between part where that E sub A is, we're going to leave that B for now, and we'll talk about that uh, when we get to chapter 11. Uh, and, uh, but for now, we'll ignore that part. On my x-axis, I have something a little bit cryptic. I have something labeled as reaction coordinate. Uh, sometimes that'll say something like reaction progress or extent of reaction is a, a, a fancy term for that. Uh, all of those things mean it's just where are we in the course of the reaction, getting from the reactants to the products. Okay, the endpoints of that, the reactants and the products, those are well-defined things. The middle ground where that mountain is in the middle and the E sub A is, that's the part that's hard to think about. Good news is in thermodynamics, we generally do not have to think about the middle part. We just have to think about the ends, right? Uh, suppose I wanna talk about delta E for this reaction. Uh, that's the energy of the products minus the energy of the reactants, right? So in this case, uh, here I have delta E and delta E now is going to be negative. Uh, I know it's negative because the products sit at lower energy than the reactants, right? In terms of energy, this reaction was downhill, uh, meaning uh, my atoms lost energy as they did this reaction, right? So this is uh, drawn for an exothermic reaction because delta E is negative. What would it look like if it was an endothermic reaction? In that case, the products would be up here somewhere, right? If they were this way, then delta E up here this would give me that height would give me delta E, but now it would be greater than zero because the energy of my products is higher than my, the energy of my reactants if I put the products up here, right? Uh, and so uh, I don't have to worry about this middle part, right? It doesn't matter how high that mountain goes uh, in this picture. Uh, the definition of my delta E depends only on where did I start and where did I end up, 
Okay, that's important. Uh, that uh, idea gets a fancy name. It says that uh, delta E is uh, path independent. Okay, uh, and on the bottom of the slide, it says that means delta E is something we call a state function. All right. Uh, why is this useful? Uh, it's useful because it means we literally don't have to know uh, what might happen between the reactants and the products. For a lot of chemical reactions, that's pretty hard to know, right? Uh, if we take a reaction that says, even that methane combustion reaction, right, that says CH4 plus two O2s makes uh, CO2 and two molecules of water, uh, we don't know how that actually takes place, right? Uh, do uh, the, the CH4 molecule and the oxygens just crash together all at once and just somehow spit out those products? Does it do some other steps along the way? Uh, maybe, you know, uh, it breaks a bond first and then some other reactions take place. We don't know anything about that, right? But we don't have to, to do thermodynamics, okay? Uh, it's basically like saying, if you want to know, uh, you know, the, uh, I don't know, the change in, say, the uh, change in, in altitude, say, uh, went from bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain, right? It doesn't matter if you just ran straight up the side of the mountain or if you, like, took a long spirally winding way around the mountain, right? Uh, you, you know, did more work, uh, traveled more distance in those cases, but your change in altitude is still the same because you started at the bottom and ended at the top, right? Uh, that's how these things work. Anything that's a state function uh, means it's path independent. Those are, those are synonymous things. Uh, in thermodynamics, we usually try to write our state functions with uppercase letters. So the fact that the E in delta E uh, is uh, an uppercase letter is meant to be a tip off that it is a state function. All the things we're going to calculate the change in, the delta of, those are generally going to all be state functions. In things you can measure and know about, most of them are state functions, right? Uh, temperature, for example, is a state function. If you measure the temperature of something, you know it's temperature, right? It just depends on the state that it's in right there. Uh, if I wanted to, if I stuck a thermometer in uh, the glass of water that's sitting next to me, I don't have to know whether that water used to be hotter or used to be colder, right? All I have to do is say it's at this temperature. That means it's a state function. It doesn't depend on how it got there. Uh, there are some things that are not state functions, it turns out, uh, and we'll see a couple of those uh, in the not too distant future. 